Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for finding your way through the crowd to, to be here. It's a little chaotic today. Um, I want to mention a couple of forthcoming events, uh, but before I do, I remind people to silence their mobile communication devices. Um, we have a couple of events this week. Tomorrow at 3.30, Tom Remington from Emory is coming to speak about what is a very important uh, book, The Politics of Inequality in Russia, and it's um, a major study and it really transforms how we think about Russia and Russian politics. So if you have any interest in Russian politics, I strongly urge that you try to, if not catch uh, Remington in person, then at least um, track down the book because um, it really is a different lens of looking at contemporary Russian politics. Then on Wednesday at 3.30, we have the next um, seminar in our Spotlight on Central Eurasia series. Um, and uh, this particular seminar will uh, feature Greg Gleason from the Marshall Center and Stacy Clawson from the University of Kentucky. Stacy's a former Wilson Center fellow, and it, they'll be speaking about energy politics. So that's Wednesday at 3.30. And next Monday, David Satter, the Hudson Institute, will be coming to talk about his new book on Russia. And on, uh, um, I guess it's Wednesday, April Fourth at 3.30, Bob Edelman from the University of California, San Diego, is going to be talking about his wonderful book on Spartak, um, A History of the People's Team and the Workers' State. And some of you may have seen an article he did a few years ago in um, American Historical Review. It's, it's, it's actually a big, much bigger story. Well, Bob's a, a great sports historian, and he's a great sports historian because he brings out the larger stories and it, and this is really a story not just about a football team but about class in Soviet era Moscow. Well it's very good to have Sarah up here and to, she's been here for a while and, and uh, it's good to have her, um, she's one of our Title Eight research scholars, it's good to have her present uh, some of her work. Uh, she completed her undergraduate work and an MA at Stanford, then received a second MA and a and her doctoral degree in history from Yale. Uh, she has won virtually every major award that she could win at this point in her career. Uh, and um, she also has a number of uh, publications that are out or in train to come out. Uh, she worked in the National Democratic Institute as the DC contact person for uh, NDI's activities in Belarus. Uh, she worked in the Pre Peace Corps in Primorsky Cry, and um, she will soon be joining the faculty at the University of Maryland in the History Department. So, congratulations Thank and you. welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming out uh, today. It's a, a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak here today. Um, before I begin, I'd like in particular to thank the, the Kennan Institute uh, for their support of my research. Um, it's been a great pleasure to be in residence here as a scholar, and I've really benefited enormously from this time uh, to work on my research. Um, as well, I've had the great pleasure to work with um, an outstanding research assistant, so I'd like to recognize Olga Lutvin, uh sitting right there for all her efforts, all her hard work. Um, it's really, you know, enormously benefited um, my presentation uh, today. So in my talk today, I'm going to speak about um, my current book project, uh, which is based upon my dissertation. Um, and my research focuses on an understudied episode in the history of Stalinist uh, social engineering. This is the Kazakh famine of 1930 to 1933. It took place in the newly created Soviet Republic of Kazakhstan. Um, let's map over here. Um, in this famine, more than a million and a half people perished. And Kazakhstan lost roughly a quarter of its population in the crisis. The famine was not due to, say, simply poor weather or crop failures, although, as I'll stress, local conditions are very important to understanding the disaster. Rather, this famine was the, uh, the result of an ideologically motivated, uh, state-driven modernization project. So in my talk today, first, I'm going to give you a brief overview of my research on the Kazakh famine. Second, I'm going to introduce Kazakhstan as a place. I see locality as particularly important to understanding this disaster, 
and I'll pay particular attention to the changes that were already ongoing in the Kazakh steppes environment on the eve of Soviet rule. Third, I'm going to look at the particular challenges that Kazakhstan posed for a regime intent on bringing about a rapid socialist-style modernization. I'll then examine how the regime addressed these challenges and, in turn, how these responses led to famine. Fourth, and finally, I'll also show how competing accounts of this disaster figure in the politics of history across the post-Soviet space, or attempts to come to terms with the legacies of Stalinism and the Soviet past. Under the auspices of a program known as the First Five-Year Plan, Stalin sought to radically transform the Soviet Union, its society, and its economy. One of the promises of the First Five-Year Plan was that the Soviet Union would overtake the capitalist West and industrialize rapidly. To do so, the regime needed to consolidate its hold over agriculture. As part of the first five-year plan, peasants were violently shunted into collective farms and communities were obliged to deliver regular procurements of meat and grain to the state. And these policies would lead to chaos, famine, and immense human suffering across much of the Soviet Union. Yet the transformation of Kazakhstan would be particularly dramatic. Prior to this famine, Kazakhs, who were a Muslim uh, Turkic-speaking group, were the republic's uh, majority ethnic group. They constituted about 60% of the population. And Russian and Ukrainian settlers made up the remaining you know, roughly 40% or so. But this famine would devastate Kazakh society and profoundly alter Kazakhstan's demographic makeup. Of the million and a half people who died in this famine, approximately 1.3 million of them were Kazakhs. And actually more than a third of all Kazakhs would actually die in this disaster. During the height of the disaster, there was also tremendous population movement. More than a million starving Kazakhs fled to neighboring Soviet republics, including Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Russia, but also to Xinjiang, which was a province of Western China. Many resettled there permanently, and the disaster in turn also altered the demographics of the broader Central Asian region. Prior to the famine, most Kazakhs had been pastoral nomads. Nomadism was a way of life that had been critical not only to Kazakhs' livelihood, but also to their very identity. The famine forced those Kazakhs who survived to sedentarize or permanently take up settled life. And so with the famine, Kazakhs actually abandoned pastoral nomadism. In fact, the effects of this famine were so devastating that Kazakhs actually became a minority in their own Soviet Republic, Kazakhstan, after the famine. And Kazakhs only regained a slim demographic majority in Kazakhstan shortly after the Republic's independence in 1991. The Kazakh famine then was one of the most dramatic consequences of Soviet, uh, of Stalinist modernization. It profoundly altered the social, demographic, and environmental profile of this region. Yet this famine is almost entirely missing from major scholarly overviews of the Soviet period. Even the disaster's major events and causal factors are not well understood. My work provides one of the first complete accounts of the Kazakh famine. My findings are based upon 18 months of fieldwork in state, party, and regional archives in Kazakhstan and Russia. I use uh, Russian language sources, but I also use Kazakh language sources, and these are sources which um, have been little used by, by scholars in the West. What were the causes of this famine? This is the question that I'm going to address in my talk today. Grain procurements and collectivization triggered this disaster, and these short-term policy changes were the most important causes of the famine. In this respect, the Kazakh famine closely resembles the deadly and better known collectivization famines that occurred in the Soviet Union's West. These include uh, the Ukrainian famine of 1932 to 33, as well as the collectivization famines that occurred in the Don, Kuban, and Volga regions of Russia. But in Kazakhstan, the disastrous effects of the, of the Stalinist regime's policy changes were further intensified by changes that were already ongoing in pastoral nomadic life. These changes had been sparked by an expansion of the Russian Empire's agrarian frontier, or massive peasant colonization of the Kazakh steppe in the late 19th century. These local conditions help explain why the Kazakh famine became, began a year earlier, that is in the fall of 1930, than the, Soviet, than the collectivization famines that afflicted the Soviet Union's West. I'm also going to argue that the particular way that the Stalinist regime impl implemented its state policy 
uh, changes on the ground intensified the disaster. While the policies themselves were brutal, the state organized a context in which violence could occur. Local cadres, then, were a crucial element of the Soviet regime's plans to implement the state-driven modernization of Kazakhstan. But as I will show, the actions of these local cadres shaped both the character and the scale of the Kazakh disaster. I'm arguing then that famine in Kazakhstan began in 1930 due to brutal central policies compounded by local level acts of aggression and violence. These two features, I contend, were further magnified by longer term changes that made Kazakh nomads far more vulnerable to hunger. But what was Kazakhstan as a place and a society like, and how did these local conditions lead to famine? Um, so now turning to the, to the map itself. The Soviet Republic of Kazakhstan was created from disparate parts in 1924. Um, it was really an, an immense territory. Um, all of these territories had been under Russian imperial rule prior to the October 1917 revolution, but they had never before been ruled as a unified whole. Um, as you can see, it borders, um, this is a map of, of contemporary Kazakhstan, um, but the borders are pretty much the same. Kazakhstan borders on Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, China, it also has a very long um, uh, border with, uh, with Russia. Um, the new republic was really quite enormous. Uh, just to give you some figures, it um, was approximately equivalent in size to continental Europe. Um, uh, uh, to give you another measurement, four times the size of the state of Texas. Uh, much of the Kazakh steppe was in fact very arid and prone to drought. Its central region was known alternately as the hungry steppe, or um, at times as the ill-fated step for the frequency of environmental crises. Kazakhstan also had quite another quite distinctive feature. Uh, the vast majority of Kazakhs were pastoral nomads, as I've mentioned. And Kazakhstan was home actually to the largest number of pastoral nomads in the entire Soviet Union. Pastoral nomads, uh, unlike peasants, are not agriculturalists. Um, Peasants' livelihood, for instance, is closely connected to uh, a specific tract, tract of land, while nomads' way of life is connected with um, their animal herds. Nomads carry out regular seasonal migrations along predetermined routes to pasture their animals. Um, so I wanted to show you very briefly um, a few slides to give you an idea of what pastoral nomadic uh, life is like. Um, these photos, by the way, come from an ethnographic expedition to the steppe in the late 1920s. Um, this is in western Kazakhstan. You get a sense of the isolation of the landscape, um, how important uh, animals are to Kazakhs' everyday um, existence as nomads. You'll notice that you don't see any cattle um, in these photographs. That's because cattle is not an animal that moves well over, over long distances. Um, you can see quite a lot of camels here. Uh, the second uh, photo is also from the same uh, ethnographic expedition to western Kazakhstan. Um, you can see some baby camels uh, uh, tied up here. Um, and you also get a sense of um, uh, these are the yurts, which are um, uh, mobile uh, dwellings, which are made out of felt, which were um, nomads' homes when they would um, nomadize. It's also important to note that um, nomads of the Kazakh steppe, like many nomads, had multiple loyalties and allegiances. Um, they were Muslims, and Islam was very important to their identity. Um, Kazakhs also identified with various clans, as well as a uh, hereditary elite. Kinship, however, or the, the, their allegiances to various clans was not just a genealogical tie, but it was also an economic one as well. And so Kazakhs' allegiances to one or another clan would help adjudicate aspects of their seasonal migrations. Soviet officials referred to these nomads as Kazakhs, but uh, nationality was not, in fact, an important organizing principle in everyday nomadic life on the eve of Soviet rule. And on the eve of Soviet rule, we can sort of think of the term Kazakh as kind of a mixed social and ethnic category, one which denoted both a nomad um, but also an ethnicity. But critically important changes to nomadic life were beginning even prior to Soviet rule. These changes were going to make Kazakhs far more susceptible to hunger, and they would also intensify the scale of the disaster. During the uh, 19th and early 20th centuries, when the Kazakh steppe was under Russian imperial rule, 
large numbers of Russian and Ukrainian settlers began to flood the steppe. Uh, most were grain farmers, and their arrival would make the Kazakh steppe into a multi-ethnic society. As well, this peasant colonization would lead to a tremendous shift in land use practices in the steppe. Um, the arrival of peasant settlers created disruptions in nomad seasonal migration routes or pastures. With their traditional routes and access to water disrupted, many nomads actually began to curtail their, the size of their migrations. Others, by contrast, would actually increase the size of their migrations. Um, many, um, at this point, would actually even travel a thousand kilometers or more uh, to reach wells or pasture lands. Prior to this peasant colonization, the nomads of the Kazakh steppe subsisted largely on an array of uh, milk and meat products. Uh, but with this peasant colonization, a very important shift began, and that is that Kazakhs actually began, began to consume more grain. And these grains, including millet and wheat, uh, became an important part of Kazakh nomads' diet. Um, this photo uh, comes from the Kazakh uh, state photo archives. Um, it's prior to the 1917 revolution. Um, you can hear, see a Kazakh woman um, uh, actually making um, barsaki, which is a very uh, delicious Kazakh dish. It's um, actually a sort of fried dough. Um, and um, it, I uh, wanted to show you this slide just to demonstrate how important uh, grain had become to, to Kazakh's diet. Um, so the growth of trade and markets in the Kazakh steppe facilitates this shift towards increasing uh, consumption of grain. Um, many Kazakhs, for instance, begin to exchange animals or animal products for grain with Russian and Ukrainian settlers uh, in seasonal markets. And these exchanges became crucial to the functioning of everyday life. Large numbers of Kazakhs also become semi-nomadic. And this means that they'll maintain some kind of dwelling, a semi-permanent dwelling during the winter time, but they still nomadize uh, during the summer. Um, and some semi-nomads, particularly in the north of Kazakhstan, actually now begin to cultivate grain themselves. Um, so more generally, we can say on the eve of Soviet rule, uh, nomadic life in the Kazakh steppe became far more fragile, and Kazakhs themselves were far more susceptible to famine. But the new Republic of Kazakhstan, as I've mentioned, posed very real practical and ideological challenges. Uh, for a, a Soviet regime that was uh, bent on bringing about a socialist-style revolution. So Karl Marx, for instance, had predicted that socialist revolutions might occur amongst workers. Lenin then radically modifies Marx's ideas, and he predicted that a socialist-style revolution might occur amongst peasants. But neither of the two men gave any thought to how and if a socialist-style revolution might occur amongst an entirely different social group pastoral nomads. So as Soviet ethnographers and scholars carefully study the efforts of other empires to incorporate large arid territories and nomadic populations. They examine, for instance, American attempts to settle um, the Native Americans of the Midwestern Plains, and they begin to actively compare their own efforts to the efforts of these other empires. And they begin to increasingly scrutinize pastoral nomads through the lens of Marxist Leninist theory they ponder a series of pressing questions. Did nomads actually have classes in the same way that, that settled societies did? And you know, if they did, how, how did these classes function? Um, economically, could pastoral nomads speed through the Marxist-Leninist timeline of history and actually be transformed into to productive factory workers? Um, so even Kazakhstan's leader and, and party secretary, um, this is him here, uh, Filip Isaevich Goloshokin. Um, he privately admits to grave doubts about the possibility of bringing revolution to pastoral nomads. Um, so a bit about uh, Goloshokin himself. He was installed as Kazakhstan's uh, party secretary in 1925. Uh, he was born in Vitebsk, which is famously, uh, it's now part of Belarus, but it was famously the birthplace of Marc Chagall. Um, and in 1932, he's actually removed with, from his position. He's publicly scapegoated by Stalin at the time as actually having caused the Kazakh famine. Um, and he's arrested in 1939 uh, as part of the party purges, and um, he's actually executed in 1941. But in a secret personal letter penned to Politburo member Vyacheslav Molotov, soon after his arrival in Kazakhstan, Goloshokin wrote, 
lawlessness, arbitrary rule, bribery, theft, and concealment, especially in the southern regions, reign above all in Kazakhstan. As a rule, there are no party workers. The Kazakh communist is technically and politically illiterate. Kazakhs are grouped by the clan principle. No one educates them, no one organizes them. Others, in turn, actually found the party's efforts to bring revolution to nomads as verging on the absurd, and uh, many Kazakhs themselves actually um, jested of the party's efforts at this time, and, and one popular joke was that you couldn't get to socialism by camel. But by late 1929, uh, a severe um, a shortage of grain across the Soviet Union actually triggers a shift in policy. Stalin declares the onset of the first five-year plan. Collectivization efforts begin in much of the Soviet Union as the regime attempts to strengthen and um, uh, modernize agriculture. In Kazakhstan, Moscow declared the onset of a program entitled sedentarization on the basis of full collectivization. And this meant really that, that nomads would actually leap through these, uh, the Marxist-Leninist timeline of history and nomads would be sedentarized or they'd be permanently settled and thrust into collective farms simultaneously. Many of these Kazakh collective farms, however, began to look very different than what uh, Marx or Lenin might have envisaged. Um, so I wanted to show you this one image. This also comes from the Kazakh state um, uh, photo archives. It's from collectivization. I was particularly struck by the image of camels uh, hooked up to plows. Um, and it, it shows you basically the importance of, uh, of animals, again, to collectivization, the lack of kind of of mechanization in the steppe. Um, and the second, um, uh, the second photo um, actually shows them, these are again are, are camels hooked up and it shows the sort of the threshing of, of the grain. So in many cases, many of these um, uh, new collective farms were organized along clan lines. While there might be a number of different clans in a given region, each clan actually had their own collective farm. In other cases, many Kazakhs actually returned to nomadic life just within the form of a collective farm. And uh, in a seeming kind of contradiction in terms, these farms actually became known as nomadic collective farms. So thus, the institution of the collective farm actually serves to perpetuate some of the so-called backward tendencies that the Soviets hoped it would eliminate. But perhaps one of the most striking features of collectivization in Kazakhstan was its brutality as well as how quickly uh, these policies led to hunger. And as my work in regional archives and with Kazakh language sources reveals, um, these brutal central policies of collectivization frequently took on a very violent local level implementation. So while the upper ranks of the party and the state bureaucracy in Kazakhstan were predominantly ethnic Russians or Kazakh or Ukrainians, um, the lower ranks of the Republic's bureaucracy in Kazakh districts were composed almost exclusively of Kazakhs. And the recruitment of these Kazakh cadres was in fact an important element of the regime's nationalities policy. Uh, this policy sought to promote the category of nationality amongst certain non-Russian groups. Um, these efforts would supposedly right the wrongs of Russian imperial rule and help non-Russian groups speed through the Marxist-Leninist timeline of history. Under Soviet nationalities policy, Moscow supported, for instance, the creation of national republics, uh, languages, and cultures. And in Kazakhstan, uh, like elsewhere, this policy, as I mentioned, brought large numbers of native cadres into the bureaucracy. Many Kazakhs, for instance, however, had only been very recently recruited into the lower level party bureaucracy. Overnight, uh, they found themselves you know, anointed as experts on a, on a district uh, agricultural commission or appointed as actually as chairman of the collective farm. And uh, like elsewhere in the Soviet Union, these efforts to collectivize agriculture were accompanied by heightened efforts to purge class enemies. Um, newly recruited Kazakh bureaucrats actually violently carried out um, grain confiscations against other Kazakhs. Many officials were actually given very little official criteria for determining who should be classified as a class exploiter and who should not. They used the campaign as a method of settling old scores or gaining personal advantage. Kinship ties also frequently intersected with these efforts. 
um, new bureaucrats use their authority to punish members of a rival clan or alternately to reward fellow kin members. And the opportunism of many new recruits was magnified in particular by the weak, overall weakness of the party's hold uh, on the Kazakh steppe as well as the sheer distances involved. And the regime's bureaucratic chain of command in turn left many crucial decisions in the hands of district officials. In the disruption that ensued, uh, livestock numbers throughout Kazakhstan plummeted. Officials reported food shortages and hundreds of thousands of people in an effort to evade collectivization began to flee Kazakhstan. Many fled across the border to China. The regime in, in turn sought to control this flow of cross-border traffic um, and armed conflict actually resulting in the death of thousands of nomads ensued. More generally, collectivization disrupted the steppe's food systems. It severed these peculiar local institutions and networks that nomads had developed um, and depended upon to survive. These brutal policies, intensified by local level violence, severed the grain trade networks that had become so important to Kazakh's diet and to their everyday existence. Starving and left without their usual supplies of grain, many Kazakhs began to slaughter their animal herds for food. Others, by contrast, sold their livestock in an effort to get grain so that they could fulfill state grain procurements. By the close of 1930 then, the party's first collectivization drive had, had wreaked almost total devastation on many Kazakhs and they had begun to starve. This moment was also an important one rhetorically as it marked the, the emergence of a new term in the uh, language of the reporting of party bureaucrats um, and this was used to describe Kazakh nomads. And the term atkachevnik literally means someone who is nomadizing away. And as I was working in the archives, I was particularly struck by how the previous term for nomad, kachevnik, uh, begins to almost disappear from um, archival documents by the state. Um, so in the eyes of those witnessing this unfolding crisis, the Republic's bureaucrats, Nomads were no longer nomads. They were now hungry people increasingly desperate for food. Um, and this slide also comes from the Kazakh uh, state photo archive. It's taken in the north of Kazakhstan um, during the early 1930s as the famine was happening. Um, and you can show um, people, they're presumably maybe fleeing to a city. Many nomads fled to cities on the rumor of food. Um, you can see that they have some children with them. Uh, one of the after effects of the famine was that uh, many children were abandoned and left in, in orphanages. These um, refugees are probably a little bit better dressed than most of, the, um, uh, most of the documents I encounter where it really describes how sort of ragtag the refugees were, how they were really left with nothing. So from the fall of 1930 onwards, the Republic underwent a tremendous societal transformation whole districts and even regions emptied out overnight. The Republic began a vast population shift. Kazakhs crowded railway stations and city streets in Kazakhstan. Hundreds of thousands of Kazakhs fled to neighboring Soviet republics such as Russia, Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan initiating a region wide crisis. Officials in these neighboring republics wrote to Moscow. They argued that they bore no responsibility to help the starving and that these nomads should be returned to Kazakhstan. Goloshokin, in turn, protested that Kazakhstan was actually in such a state of crisis that it could not accept the starving back. Moscow, in turn, ordered that these starving Kazakhs fled should be resettled where they had fled in these neighboring republics. This moment, the end of 1930, was a crucial moment. As dispossessed of their livestock, nomads could no longer be nomads. Without the state's immediate assistance, however, they could not actually take up settled life. And in, in the words of one of the Republic's officials, these nomads were actually strung around the neck of the state. Late 1930 also marked the beginning of a massive escalation in a different type of violence. And this violence would consume the Republic from 1931 to 1933. As hunger and suffering overcame the Republic, neighbor was actually pitted against neighbor in a desperate struggle for survival the very fabric of society began to be torn asunder. Mothers cannibalized their own children and roving bands of people shot, uh, shot someone simply for a crust of bread. People who lived in Kazakhstan at the time noted that actually whole villages vanished from maps. 
that the step echoed and the wind whistled through lines of abandoned huts. If you actually took a train north to Moscow through the Kazakh steppe during the famine, you would actually see rows and rows of corpses stretched out into the horizon near the railroad tracks. These were the bodies of people who had congregated near, rail, near train stations in a desperate attempt to find food. Outbreaks of disease, particularly typhus, smallpox, and cholera, emerged amongst these starving populations. And in fact, actually many uh, regions of Kazakhstan were so stricken by disease uh, that party officials, fearful for their own lives, actually refused to go there. By late 1930, the beginning of the onset of this disaster, the level of hunger and widespread migration in the Republic had actually grown so grave that Goloshokin wrote to Stalin. The disastrous effects of the party's policies on pastoral nomads was clear. Goloshokin detailed for Stalin what he termed mistakes and complications in the party's work with the Republic's Kazakh populations. He noted that the Republic's nomadic regions were being sacrificed for the cause of grain. And it was at this moment, a very critical moment, the fall of 1930, famine in the Kazakh steppe could no longer be averted. Kazakhs' way of life as well as their livelihood lay in ruins. And this radical course of state-driven modernization, the first five-year plan, would come to have disastrous effects throughout much of the Soviet Union a year, early, a year later in the fall of 1931. But by the fall of 1930, the Kazakh steppe had already begun to starve and this disaster was known to Stalin. To conclude, I'll first address the question that I raised at the beginning of my talk, or how hunger came to, Kazakh, to the Kazakh steppe by 1930. Second, I'll also turn to a brief examination of how the Kazakh famine uh, revises our understanding of this period in Soviet history. Third and finally, I'll examine how the Kazakh famine is remembered in Kazakhstan today and what role it continues to play in uh, the politics of history across the post-Soviet space. I've argued that famine in the Kazakh steppe began in 1930 due to brutal central policies. The effects of these uh, brutal central policies were compounded by the violent way many of them were implemented on the ground um, uh, by local cadres, many of whom were Kazakhs. These two factors, I contend, were magnified by a third factor, or longer term changes in the steppe uh, that made Kazakhs uh, far more dependent upon grain and thus far more vulnerable to hunger. It's clear that the regime's broader goal was to transform Kazakhs and Kazakhstan radically with little regard for the tremendous loss of life incurred in the process. Moscow's policies, for instance, anticipated the cultural destruction of Kazakh societies. But I find no evidence to indicate that these plans for a violent modernization of Kazakhstan ever became transformed into a desire to eliminate Kazakhs as a group. But the story of Kazakhstan also reflects more broadly. And here I'm gonna to turn to the larger picture of the Soviet Union during this period. The Kazakh famine was the Soviet Union's first experience of mass death during the first five year plan. As such, it revises our chronology of the development of terror. It also sheds light on the question of intentionality, which for instance has been the subject of so much debate and one of the other collectivization famines that I mentioned earlier, uh, the Ukrainian famine. Most scholarship on the Ukrainian famine might be roughly divided into two schools. One, those who see the Ukrainian famine as an orchestrated attack by the regime against Ukrainians as a national group. Two, others view the Ukrainian famine as part of a broader assault by the regime against a social category, peasants. And these scholars point to the existence of famine amongst the peasantry in other parts of the Soviet Union, such as the Don, Kuban, and the Volga regions of Russia. My work alters how we view this debate. While many, while many scholars imply that the regime's treatment of Ukrainians was distinct, my work shows that there was a far broader swath of terror during this period. Many of the brutal tactics used in Ukraine in 1932 to 33, such as the closure of borders so that starving peasants could not flee, were actually used a year earlier um, in Kazakhstan first in, uh, from 1930 to 31. Previous scholarship, for instance, has suggested that outsiders carried out the regime's uses of violence against particular ethnic groups. Usually these outsiders are framed as Russians or at the very least as foreigners sent from Moscow, 
My work, however, shows that many of these violent policies were actually carried out by insiders or locals working on the ground. Programs such as grain procurements were centrally planned in Moscow. But in Kazakhstan, due in part to the remoteness and the complexity of the landscape, crucial choices and decisions about the implementation of these party programs were left to activists at the republic, the regional, or most often actually at the, at the most uh, local level. The choices of these local cadres often serve to intensify rather than mitigate the destructive policies first unleashed, unleashed by central planners. So as I've shown, Soviet nationality's policy in Kazakhstan was simultaneously a creative and a destructive process. This policy bought large numbers of Kazakhs into the bureaucracy at the same time that it gave these new bureaucrats some measure of responsibility for the character of their own society's transformation. We might ask then what type of society um, emerged from the Kazakh famine, what the particular character of this transformation was. The regime's policies led to the elimination of pastoral nomadism, a goal of the campaign. Kazakhs were reformulated from a pastoral nomadic society into a settled one. Yet it is clear that the regime could not transform Kazakh society uh, entirely in the manner that it wished. Kinship, for instance, which was a tie that the regime sought to eliminate, continued to play a role in Kazakh's new settled life. The regime, in addition, had um, uh, proclaimed that its modernization campaign would eliminate Kazakh nomads' hereditary elite. Yet some measures, some members of the hereditary elite who were known as the, the white bone aristocracy survive these campaigns and they continue to play a role in Kazakh society after collectivization. Finally, I've also promised to discuss how this disaster is remembered in today, remembered in Kazakhstan today, and how competing interpretations of, of uh, the Kazakh famine are used. In Kazakhstan, public discussion of the famine first began in the late 1980s and 1990s. Um, many of these early investigations were done by demographers. Um, they put together different census figures um, and they purported to have discovered uh, this horrifying uh, loss of life in Kazakhstan. In 1991, with the fall of the Soviet Union, Kazakhstan becomes an independent nation. And during the early years of Kazakhstan's independence, discussion of the famine uh, dominated uh, scholarly and popular media. And in 1992, uh, Kazakhstan's president, Nursultan Nazarbayev, uh, orders that a presidential commission investigate this disaster. Um, the commission uh, investigated the disaster and it ruled that the Kazakh famine was a genocide. But strangely, many of these studies, which stem from the early and the mid 1990s, um, they offer actually only a slightly revised version of the Soviet explanation for the disaster. Um, they refer to the disaster as Goloshokin's genocide, um, and they frame Goloshokin as appropriating uh, brutal policies from Stalin and intensifying them further to punish Kazakhs as a group. Um, some of these local studies also have a far uglier side. Um, Goloshokin himself was Jewish, and many of these studies adopt an um, implicitly or an explicitly anti-Semitic tone. Since the late 1990s, however, um, public and scholarly examination of the famine in Kazakhstan has slowed. Um, a few scholars continue to investigate limited aspects of the disaster. Um, in particular, popular rebellion during the famine is still a big topic. Um, and demographers uh, in turn continue to um, debate the famine's long-term effects. Um, many note that, for instance, Uzbekistan, which is Kazakhstan's neighbor, um, their rival for regional supremacy uh, did not suffer similar population losses during the famine. Um, and they speculate that Kazakhstan's population would actually now far outnumber Uzbe Uzbekistan's if it uh, were not for the disaster. But new research on the famine itself and its causes has largely come to a halt in Kazakhstan. Um, and this is in particular contrast, of course, to Ukraine, where uh, the, uh, the famine forms an important part of uh, Ukraine's national identity. Identifying the reasons for the shift will require uh, further study, um, but it's possible to offer a few hypotheses on, on why uh, discussion of the famine has slowed. Kazakhstan in particular has a, cl a very close relationship with Russia. 
Um, Kazakhstan's leaders may fear that further discussion of the famine will incite diplomatic tensions or anger Kazakhstan's large Russian uh, ethnic minority. And Russia, for instance, has acted to refute uh, claims of genocide in the case of the Ukrainian famine. Others may worry that further examination of the famine will lead Kazakhs to confront uncomfortable parts of their own past, including the discovery that the label of Koloshokin's genocide uh, does not fit the disaster. Um, I regularly asked co Kazakh colleagues about this when I was in Kazakhstan, um, and um, some Kazakh historians did suggest to me that there is uh, kind of a, a lingering ambivalence about uh, the legacies of the Soviet past in Kazakhstan. Um, you know, that people acknowledge that the Soviet experience led to enormous loss of life, um, but they also see it as having positive aspects as well, or the idea that, that Kazakhs were transformed from a so-called backward a nomadic society into a modern settled one. Um, and so just to illustrate this move away from public discussion of the Kazakh famine, uh, I wanted to show you uh, one final image. Um, this is actually of a memorial, uh, which is, um, so the, the inscription on here says, um, a monument to the victims of the famine of 1931 to 33 will be built in this place. And um, I'm not sure exactly when this monument uh, was put up uh, I'm sometime in the mid-1990s, but um, I took this picture in 2007 when I was doing my field research. Um, you can see nothing has happened. I went past back uh, this past uh, June when I was in Almaty. Again, nothing has happened, and it's a bit um, sort of overgrown with, uh, with weeds and, and so on. Um, so I think that sort of, in a, in a way, kind of captures um, how research on, on the famine has slowed. Um, so thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I want to begin, actually, by talking about something you didn't really mention, which is the private memory of the famine. Uh, presumably, uh, this was such a traumatic event for Kazakh society that between the 1930s and 1980s, there, it was remembered privately. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could say a few words about the, the different kinds of private memory be, when it was un when people really couldn't talk about it publicly, do you have any sense at all of the extent to which families uh, or communities talked about what happened? Um, how was it remembered? Um, I, I should say first that I did not um, I did not do oral history interviews for this project. I made a decision really. Um, in a sense, I almost had two very massive topics that I was dealing with. One was the famine itself, what actually happened, and then it's almost a second uh, project, uh, really the memory of, of the famine itself. Um, I was surprised to the extent um, to which it, it was, it seems not to have been discussed. Um, so yes, I, I mean, I, th I think people, people did talk about it. Um, they brought in understandings of, of Kazakh history in particular to, to explain it. Um, so one of the popular uh, ways of connecting and linking up this disaster with the Kazakh past is to compare it to the invasion of the Jungers. Um, and so to talk about, um, to, to com they, they use a term um, uh, which is which is referred to you, um, uh, which refers to the Junger invasion, and they talk about this as kind of the second uh, kind of Junger invasion or or suffering. Um, but I, I I certainly was surprised to the extent that that which people did not seem to talk about it very much. Okay, now open for questions, comments, Thomas. <coughs> My name is Thomas Grindley. Kazakhstan seems to have become a dumping ground for populations inimical to the Soviet regime. Was this also true at the time of the famine? And if so, how did they fare then and subsequently? Um, yes, so during the period of the famine, there were certainly different groups coming uh, coming in and, and being resettled in Kazakhstan. So um, uh, at some point in the late 1920s, they reopened the Kazakh-stepped colonization. So there are certain uh, 
there are peasant settlers coming into the Kazakh steppe. Um, another um, a, another important um, feature in this period is is they um, uh, construct a labor camp, or actually Karlag, um, near Karaganda. And so these people are actually being um, shunted and, and deported into Kazakhstan as the famine itself is actually already ongoing and they have news that, that conditions on the ground are, are, not, um, are, are, are not going so well. In general, I think um, many of the people who were deported were, um, uh, you know, they, they, were settled, they were settled societies and in general those people fared better in the famine than, than pastoral nomads. Okay, we have Will. Sarah, I'm curious more about these local cadres at the very bottom that are yeah. implementing these policies. You talk about how they were, you, the power was given to local Kazakhs, but at the same time, Kazakhstan as a state had only existed for 12 years. So if you could just give a little bit more of a description of what sort of Kazakh identity these local officials actually had, and were they really in a position to be trained? After all, they, they were nomads only 10, 15 years ago, and all of a sudden they're running kind of sophisticated bureaucracies or less than well, sophisticated un unsophisticated maybe. <laughs> um, well, you've hit upon definitely one of the difficult questions in my, in my research in figuring out exactly who these people were on the ground. Um, many of them actually were in officials under Russian imperial rule. So, um, in, in, and one of the things you'll notice is in the archives, people in the archival documents, people will actually refer to many of these officials who were Soviet officials by their old, Russian uh, imperial titles. Um, and, um, uh, but let's see, so some of the other, other features, many of them, uh, many of them were illiterate um, of the local cadres. Um, some of them, um, uh, um, some of them came, stemmed from uh, particular clans. Um, so, uh, you know, for instance, they would, they would bring in um, members of another clan um, to supervise uh, affairs in one district. Um, but one of the things I notice um, during the height of the Soviet, um, during the height of collectivization is that there was also tremendous turnover um, so that they would bring in um, officials, um, they would stay for a year, then they would bring in uh, someone else. So uh, very often people were of a different clan than the, the people that they, they were actually uh, supervising. Right here. Thanks very much for the talk, Sarah. It was very interesting. Um, the clans, the clan identity has come in uh, at a number of points in your talk and in your answers as well. And I, I wonder how that's reflected in the documents. Um, do people self-identify as being from a particular clan? Or is this uh, officials saying so-and-so of such a clan did so-and-so, did, did to so-and-so of another clan? And therefore, it's something that's seen by officials. Uh, or do uh, official Soviet employees, either Kazakh or Russian, explain violence and conflict in clan terms? I mean, is it, is it being used as an analytical category? Um, thank, thanks for your question. It's an excellent question. Um, it, it's a really difficult question, and I would say both. So people both um, at the higher level, people explain this as an a analytical category. They say, oh, this is all about clans. But then if you look at regional archival documents, people are actually talking about how these, how uh, clan divisions play a role. They say, you know, um, I'm from so-and-so clan and I noticed that, you know, um, uh, that, 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 you know, this clan was, was, um, uh, that an elder from this clan was doing this to this clan and so on. So it, it plays a role in both ways. It's, it's a really difficult thing to, to look at in the archives, um, simply because um, one, I, I had a sense in some circumstances that I was not actually seeing the full range of documents. This is still a very um, sensitive issue in, in Kazakhstan today. In fact, um, when Kazakhstan, Kazakh historians usually uh, talk about this issue, they, um, portray different clans ha as having kind of risen up during the famine, but then the idea, they, they also sort of say that all clan divisions uh, disappeared with the famine itself and this kind of united Kazakhs as a, as, um, a, a people. Um. Actually, I was, I was gonna mm -hmm. raise that latter point. Mm -hmm. how, much, um, how much did the famine and, and the great upheavals destroy the, the structures that were there before? 
Um, I think in a sense, it, it certainly, they want to portray it as that um, clan life uh, actually disappeared with the famine, which is not true, that these structures uh, continued, uh, continued to play a role in Kazakh life. And there have been a number of, um, you know, investigations, for instance, by political scientists um, in the more recent period on how these um, continued to play a role in, um, in Kazakh society. I mean, certainly it reconfigured it in a sense because um, a clan, e clans, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, they had both um, a genealogical uh, function, but they also had a, an important economic function in nomadic life. And with the famine itself, pastoral nomadism, you know, is largely destroyed. And so um, clan uh, functions continue, but they don't, they don't have this kind of crucial economic function in the sense that you know, um, uh, in, in the sense that people took over, say, communal responsibilities for someone's um, herd or for um, helping out a neighbor, um, but they, they, they continue in, in, a certain, in a certain form. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, we have a question down here. <coughs> My name is Inchi Bowman, International Committee for Crimea. I appreciate your very lucid presentation. Mm -hmm. I, you mentioned that you uh, did not focus on uh, oral history interviews, mm -hmm. so that's understandable, but are you aware of any popular uh, me literatures, mm -hmm. social media, uh, maybe not social, popular media, and the film industry? Several years ago, um, I saw this film, A uh, Gift to Stalin, mm -hmm. a Kazakh yeah. film, but that de dealt with the 40s deportation, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, deportations uh, with the, in the 40s. So, are there are there any efforts to produce popular literature or films relating to the famine? I've been surprised by how little there is actually. Um, uh, I um, was just talking with a colleague about this earlier. There's one um, memoir called um, Silent Step. It was first published in Russian, then issued in English. Um, it's a memoir of a Kazakh nomad under Stalin. The sort of complicating factor is that the author was maybe only 10 or 12 when it when the famine happened. And then this memoir itself was pu published only, you know, maybe uh, a, a couple years ago. And he's now, you know, uh, uh, quite elderly. So you have to read it sort of with a, with a grain of salt, I think. Um, there are a couple of other... Um, uh, accounts. Um, there's one, uh, a novel which was published um, basically in the late, the late 80s, but sort of still in the Soviet period um, called the, the Lonely Yurt. Um, so this looks at it. And then there, there have been a couple of um, movie and, and film accounts um, in the n that were issued in the, in the 1990s. Um, but I've, I've actually had um, a great deal of difficulty even uh, tracking some of them down. Um, and so it seems that, you know, many of them are sort of not really distributed or very, very available. Um, when I was in Kazakhstan this past summer, um, there was a recent movie issue called um, Zeroik, and it looks at, um, uh, it looks at the development of, of Kazakhstan. It, it mentions the, the famine a little bit in the beginning, um, but I've been surprised by, by how little there is. Um, Stephen? My name is Stephen Shore. My question is, how, what have became of land ownership? Is it, uh, has it remained collectivized or has it been privatized um, since independence? Um, I don't know if I'm the best, to, the best person to, to address that, but um, yeah, I mean, a lot of it has been, has been privatized, yes. So. Okay, uh, right here and then Olga, and then I think there was a question down here and we'll wrap up. So this gentleman right here. Uh, Don Wallace, uh, Sarah, you said that um, there's been surprisingly little attention paid to the, to the famine, and you attributed that to the fact that their population is sort of roughly half Russian, Ukrainian, and Kazakh, and also the relationship with Russia itself. To what extent would you attribute this to the fact that Nazarbayev is himself a survivor of the uh, Soviet Union? That... Um that in, that certainly could be could be possible. Um, uh, I mean, it's it's also been one of the other sort of um, notable events in Kazakh history is in the late 1980s. In 1986, there are, are riots, um, uh, and a number of, of rioters are actually killed. Um, and there's also been um, 
investigations, but only of a particular sort into into that disaster. And it's one of the rumors is that that um, not, uh, Nazarbayev himself was also ordered involved in ordering some of the um, some of the, the the killings of protesters that that went on. Um, so certainly, yes, that I mean that that also could play into it. Olga. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and, you know, I realize I can ask you any time, but uh, <laughs> the question never occurred to me until just now. How much was religion a factor in the famine? Was there a breakdown of religion and values tradition within the family or within society? Um, so thanks for your question. Um, it's interesting. I think so a lot of research that's gone on um, uh, in looking at Soviet Central Asia during this period is almost has talked about it as, as an assault. Um, there is the argument that, um, that the Soviets, in a sense, tried to create a surrogate uh, proletariat amongst amongst women. There was a, a devailing cam campaign. Um, but one thing about Kazakhstan is that religion and Islam was practiced in quite a different way than it was amongst some of their uh, settled neighbors, that religion played uh, a different role. Kazakhs, for instance, did not um, veil their women. Um, I think that um, certainly in terms of um, popular rebellion, religion plays an important role because there are these kind of um, trans-regional networks that connect um, the Kazakh nomads, particularly with, um, with Xinjiang. Um, and um, one of the goals of, um, uh, during collectivization, they go after um, many, um, uh, you know, many sort of local elites and so on. And they actually, of course, they try to um, eliminate some of the Kojas, who are the um, it, this is kind of an Islamic elite uh, within Kazakh society, but they were not um, they were not entirely successful. Um, but it's it's tricky. Again, religion is one a, a very difficult thing to to get out of uh, the documents. And I think this will be the final question. Yelena Mateva, I have a question. When you look at modern history school books today mm -hmm. in Kazakhstan, yeah. what do they have about this uh, famine? Um, it's interesting. This is how I actually far first got interested in the topic. I went to Kazakhstan. I started to learn Kazakh, um, and I started looking at kids' history school t textbooks. Be and I thought, you know, why why have I never heard of of this famine? Why have I never seen this in any uh, overview of the Soviet period? Um, they still very much adhere to the the idea of this was Goloshokin's genocide. That is exactly the term that is used. Goloshokin is really portrayed as kind of a villain uh, backed up by Stalin. So they, they take sort of a quite, uh, you know, simplistic uh, view, view of what happened. But certainly it's, it's mentioned and, and discussed in, in school history textbooks. Very good. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>